Good morning, everybody. I especially want to welcome you here today. If you're not usually a part of Central Online, I'm glad that you're here. And this is the time we get to spend some time together in God's Word. December of 1990, the McAllister family had accidentally left Kevin at home alone as they flew to France for their family vacation. It was a group effort, largely due to Kevin getting in trouble, so Home Alone 2, when the family planned another trip around Christmas time, they took more measures to make sure that Kevin didn't get left at home. He didn't, but in a run through the airport, he got separated from his family and boarded a different plane than them, heading for New York instead of Florida with everyone else. It's only when he begins to uh, gets off the plane and begins to realize that he's not there with his family, he's not in Florida, and he asks a lady working the ticket counter what city it is that he sees out the window. And when she tells him it's New York City, his jaw drops, and he summarizes the whole movie. Yikes, I did it again. I wonder how many people will get into the middle of the Christmas season or just past it Take a look at how they're doing and go, yikes, I did it again. I had the same problems a year ago. I had the same good intentions last year. I had the same family drama last year. I had the same financial strain last year. I was going to do better, and here I am again. What's the thing that you think of? Share it in the comments. Type it in. What's your yikes this year, that thing about yourself that you wish was different? Type it in there. I find myself there. Yikes, I was going to keep up exercising better. Yikes, I was going to have the garage done and all the outdoor work uh, finished before now. Yikes, I was going to keep the stress levels down. Christmas season sometimes accents life's negatives. The new absence of a loved one, damaged relationships, life that's out of balance, and especially regrets about failures of the past. So you there this morning, you, home alone, how are you doing this Christmas? Do you find yourself saying some form of, yikes, I did it again this time of year? I hope today to find some help for that, a way to approach Christmas without feeling bogged down by the regrets of what's past. I think the greatest way out of it is to focus on the good news of the season. I don't mean just thinking positively, I mean to focus on the good news that is the very heart and core of what Christmas is all about. And I find that in a part of Scripture that's not often associated with the Christmas story, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So let's get unconventional for a little while this morning and see if we can't rise above another Christmas in the trenches. Signed into Facebook here this morning, there are several people whose lives are a turnaround story. You surrendered your life to Jesus Christ and what He has done. And many of you could tell and would tell without hesitating that there's a world of difference between the person who was and the person who is. But that will always, the one thing that will always really matter is this. What have you become? Because in Jesus, there's no past to hang over your head. There's only the present and the future. What have you become? You who accepted Jesus just recently, how has that changed you? You who accepted Jesus years ago, what's spiritually different about you now than just a few years ago? You who have been rejecting Jesus all of your life right up to this moment, what have you become because of your years of rejecting Him? What could you become today? I hope you'll give that serious thought because there are features of life that change when our lives are completely turned over to Jesus. For instance, what motivates us changes. Let's read together in chapter 5, verse 11. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. 
For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Paul had some opponents in Corinth, but he wasn't too worried about the people who were trying to cause trouble for him. What really mattered to him was what motivated Paul to action, and that is Christ's love. Have you ever been or felt like you were controlled by someone's love? Verse 14 there says, For the love of Christ controls us, controls like the love of a spouse that restrains you from straying, or the love of a father or a mother that calls you away from the pressure of peers to be something better. The love of a child that urges you to press on with your difficult marriage or your miserable job, pushing you, energizing you, compelling you. Paul looks at how much Jesus loves him and he says, it controls me, it compels me. It's not just some positive influence in his life, it has taken hold of him and it directs the way he lives. When a person wholly gives his life over to Jesus, he becomes someone who is driven by that love. Jesus' love for us is what leads us to respond with love to him, and it's his love that continues to shape us and move us through life. Paul could have pointed to a whole list of reasons to get right with God, but instead he reminds us of Jesus' love. You know, you're going to be controlled by something. Your job, your family, your appetite for pleasure or achievement or power, whatever it may be, you're going to be driven by something, even if you're driven to do not much. Why not have it be something entirely pure and wonderful? This Christmas time, when you get tired or distracted and really don't feel like trying anymore, remember Jesus. Remember him in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying that he'll have the strength to go on and die for you. When you can't find a reason to care about another person's need, remember how Jesus cared for you and your greatest need. When you don't know just how much more of yourself you can give, remember the cross once again. How much of himself Jesus gave for you. And when you feel like giving up, remember, Jesus didn't. Christ's love controls us. Understand that and focus on that this Christmas. What's going to motivate you more? Then let's read on in chapter 5, verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Another help to rise above our past this Christmas is to focus on our new makeup. No, not our new foundation and eyeliner. I mean the stuff of which we are made. Those things about us, when you put them all together, that are us. Those features about ourselves that affect how we look at the person in the mirror and how we look at others, our makeup. Verse 17 says, The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. What have you become? Take some time right now, think about how that impacts our view, how it affects the way that we look at others. Did you catch what we just read there in verse 14? One has died for all, therefore all have died. When Jesus died, in some way, everyone died. When someone dies, you don't look at them the same. We don't speak about them the same. They have stepped into a different realm. Once we recognize that everyone has died in some sense, we don't look at them the same way as before. And yet, how often do we tend to 
look at people and decide what we'll think about them or their worth because of purely human things like looks and social status and intelligence and street smarts or talent. None of those things matter when a person's dead. So put that together with a person who is a new creation and all that old stuff is even more irrelevant. The new has come. That's a different way to look at people with the past, isn't it? It also affects the way that we look at ourselves. Lindsay Clegg, a businessman, told about an old warehouse he was selling. The building had been empty for months. It needed repairs. Vandals had damaged the doors. They had smashed the windows. They'd thrown trash all over the place. And as he showed a prospective buyer the property, he was careful to say he was going to replace the broken windows, bring in a crew to fix any structural damage, clean out the garbage. The buyer looked at him and said, forget about the repairs. When I buy this place, I'm going to build something completely different. I don't want the building. I want the site. That's God's message about us. Compared to the makeover God has in mind, our efforts to improve our own lives make as much sense as sweeping a warehouse that's slated for the wrecking ball. God comes to make all things new. And what he wants is the sight and permission to build. Some people are trying to reform themselves. God wants more for you. He wants to redeem you. And that's something you can't do for yourself. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, says this. Give me all. I don't want so much of your time and so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you. I have not come to torment your natural self, but to kill it. No half measures are any good. I don't want to cut off a branch here and a branch there. I want to have the whole tree down. I don't want to drill the tooth or crown it or stop it, but to have it out. Hand over the whole natural self, all the desires which you think innocent, as well as the ones you think wicked, the whole outfit. I will give you a new self instead. In fact, I will give you myself. My own will shall become yours. How do you look at others? and yourself. When Jesus enters a person's life, they aren't just changed, they're redone. I believe that, that God can change your makeup, that he can completely redo you into a new creature who faces every day with a clean slate. Take every Christmas yikes from the past and realize this, if you're in Jesus, you're a new creature every day. Let's read on in verse 18. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain, for he says, in a favorable time, I listened to you, and in a day of salvation, I've helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. The last thing I want us to consider here is our great mission. Rather than just talk about this, let me just show it. If you haven't done this, let me appeal to you on behalf of Jesus Christ to accept what he has done for you. Please be reconciled to God. That's part of being in Christ. His love compels us to compel others. 
See what He did for you. See what He has for you. See that the need is urgent. For our sake, He made Him to be sin who knew no sin. Have you ever had to deal with something being in the trash that you didn't mean to throw away? Somehow I'm on the search and rescue team for the missing receipt or whatever it is that got thrown in there. There's nothing quite like eggshell spaghetti sauce and cottage cheese with a dusting of coffee grounds. Ew. But I don't have to get in with it. And I don't have to become trash to look through it. I don't have to go with it to the dump and be buried with it. After I'm done playing in it, I can close up the bag, put it in the can, and wash my hands. Sin isn't so easy. Sin takes more than just digging through it. The only way to kill it, to take away its power, was to put it on Jesus and allow him to be killed. The only way for the suffering of hell to be taken out of our futures was for Jesus to receive the brunt of our punishment himself. At the moment he hung dying on the cross, Jesus was wearing my sin and yours. No, wait, that's not what it says. It says he became sin. There are other places that say the same. Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Hebrews 2.9 says Jesus suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Ephesians 5.2 says Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Look at the cross. Consider what Jesus did for you. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. It's beyond ironic that the sinless, perfect son of God would have to die so that we could have forgiveness of our sins and life. But that's the only way that we can be called righteous. Can't happen on our own. So I implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Look again in chapter 2, verse 6. For he says in a favorable time, I listen to you. And in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. When is that? What day? Paul's glad you asked. What day does God intend for a person to accept Jesus? Well, the day that you understand that you need to. The day that you read these words and the love of Christ constrains you. The Holy Spirit would have you realize today, today is the day. Now is the time. There's no good reason for you to put off accepting him. The need is urgent. In my mind, I can picture three demons arguing over the best way to destroy God's plan of salvation for the world. The first one says to the other two, well, let's convince people that there's no heaven. Take away the reward incentive and the mission will collapse. The second demon says, no, no, let's tell everyone there's no hell. Take away the fear of punishment and the mission will collapse. And the third demon says, no, nah, you're both wrong. There is one better way. Let's tell everyone there's no hurry. And all three of them go, that's it. All we have to do is tell them there's no hurry and the whole Christian enterprise will collapse. If there is one yikes that needs to be lifted from your Christmas, it's the idea that there's no hurry when it comes to being right with God. The term post-haste goes back to the time of Henry VIII. Postmasters were given relays of horses to carry messages for the king to important cities throughout England. Some of the couriers were irresponsible and they wasted time on the way in taverns and, and inns. So 
a rather drastic law was put into effect. Anyone who was caught delaying his messages would be publicly hanged. Every dispatch carrier should ride for his life, they were told. And often there was drawn on the letters a picture of a man suspended from a gallows and beneath it was this warning, haste, post, haste, haste for thy life. By the 19th century that was discontinued, but the old expression remains as a reminder that the utmost speed and urgency is required when the king's business is involved, haste, post, haste. Today, the king's business is involved. The message is urgent. You who've been putting off accepting Jesus Christ up to this point in your life, please understand today, Christ's love compels us to tell you, as his ambassadors, be reconciled to God. In a moment, we're going to give you an opportunity to respond to us online, and it will involve uh, connecting with us through an address that we're going to put up on the screen. Take a moment today. Would you do that? Don't put it off anymore. And let us make a connection with you so that we together can look at God's Word and see what it means to become a follower of Jesus.